All right guys, so to finish off our engineering drawing section, we are gonna be working on a bit of prop replication. We've done a little bit of it before, but we're gonna be pushing it even further. We are gonna be making the very end of Obi-Wan Kenobi's lightsaber, which is known as the emitter. This is the kind of iconic end where the, uh, well, the lightsaber comes out of, and it's a really intricate, difficult part. Um, I believe it was the very end of a World War II machine gun. Uh, a lot of the original props were just kind of jumbled together with random bits of junk, so they're all real parts, but they always look a little strange. So we're gonna be putting in a good amount of information into this singular part, and we're gonna be making it in a way that, hey, I can give this over to a manufacturer, or I can give this over to a buddy that may want to work on the CAD portion as well. So even though we may have multiple features that could be compressed into one thing, we're gonna be making it in a really specific way that you can very easily will actually manufacture it as you go through the stages. So we'll start out with a big chunk of material as if you started out with a big cylinder of aluminum and then carve away parts, drill out holes, thread those holes and kind of go on as it is. So we'll start off with a line starting from the origin going over to the left. Um, as we add more and more uh, lines and angles to this, remember we don't care about how accurate uh, or scaled any of this geometry is, we just want to put it down. So we're going to be coming up, then going off to the right, going up again, off at an angle, flat, up, flat again, then up at an angle, flat, and then back down again. So our part looks a little funky, but as you can see, we can still mess around with all this. So kind of make uh, all of these kind of spread apart as if you can. And now we can add in all of the dimensions that you can find in your packets. Uh, the first thing I like to do is always dimension uh, the height and the width of it, and that usually sets everything about right in scale, and then you can start to add on all of your features as you go along. Alright, so it looks like we have all of our dimensions placed on there. Um, just cleaning up all the dimensions so they all are nice and parallel to each other. Um, it will always make sure anytime someone clicks on this uh, to well go and look at all the dimensions inside the settings uh, that it's a little easier to see what's going on. Um, what you'll notice is that all my dimensions for my diameter they're all inside my piece and everything that is uh, linear or going down the axial length of my part they're all on the outside of this piece. So all the dimensions on this is looking good so we can go ahead and hit finish sketch. And then we want to make this a revolution. This is a part that's gonna be put on the lathe, that is a rotational part. So we can hit revolve, select this lower line as our uh, well axis of revolution, and then click okay. And this looks pretty good. But we also have a lot of material to take out on the inside. So we're actually going to be doing a second sketch and then a second cut revolution. Um, this is purely just so a person that can look at this part can say, hey, this is the outside uh, portions, this is the information for the internal portions. Uh, if you wanted to, if you wanted to be even more efficient, you could combine both of these, but then your sketch becomes really densely populated with all of your dimensions and constraints, and it can be a little tricky to see what's going on. So if you want to, you can always split apart your sketches and features into multiple steps. That's perfectly okay. Um, but to do this, we want to still make a sketch on that front plane, but our part is kind of blocking it and it's kind of being a little annoying. So let's go ahead and turn off bodies in the browser. Don't worry, it is still there. You can always click the little eye icon to get it back, but we'll start a brand new sketch on that front plane. So I still want the information about the previous sketch on here. So I can expand the sketches section and then turn back on this first sketch. This second sketch, this is what we're working on right now. Um, I want to be able to snap and click to these points, so let's just click P and then select uh, these two end stops and this bottom one, might why not, and then click OK. And you can see they are purple for projection and then I can actually click and work to it. So we're going to use the line tool again and we are just going to make a series of steps where we're just looking for five uh, horizontal sections. Um, Remember, if you accidentally make one part at an angle, not the end of the world, you can always put in uh, a horizontal or vertical constraint and that'll make the angled line perfectly flat. So 
So now that we've put in all of our dimensions for our pieces, uh, you'll notice that this, all these internal lines, these are all of our radii, essentially. Uh, for example, this uh, hole will end up being 0.25 inches in diameter to accept a quarter 20 thread. So we can just set this as an eighth inch diameter over here. The other thing you'll want to notice is that even though I've got five of these horizontal lines, I'm actually only dimensioning four of them. Because I've set the maximum width of this already, if I was to put in another dimension right here, this would actually over constrain. It would say, hey, you've got too much information and you've already designed exactly how large it's supposed to be. So we can just set cancel for that. And then again, we can hit finish sketch. And now to make a revolution, if I was to turn my body on, it's actually really hard to click on my sketch because it's kind of inside everything. So I can turn off my body, hit revolve and say, yep, this is the profile that I would like to revolve. This is my lower axis. And then instead of setting my operations new body, I want to say cut. When I do that, it'll say, hey, there's nothing to cut. What are you talking about? And you go, aha, I've already made one. Let's turn on the body. And then you can see that the red will cut everything away. And then we can click OK. So anytime you see these little errors, if you know what you're doing, you won't be worried. Uh, but if I don't tell you that and you see a big error going, ah, eh, nothing's working, then you're like, oh gosh, what's that? Um, and then again, we do have that original sketch still in there. Don't want to see it, so we can turn that off. Now, when we're manufacturing this, these two edges right there and right there, they are going to be kind of sharp. Uh, and like we said before, anytime you've got perfectly 90 degree angles on edges, really not a good idea for manufacturing. It's a stress concentration zone. It's also known as a stress riser. It's basically a place where if it's going to break, that's where it's going to happen. So you can either put in a fillet or a chamfer on these two edges. Uh, I think chamfers look a little bit better. They're slightly easier to make on a, on a metal lathe. And we're just going to make them 0.04 inches. That's about one millimeter. That's small enough where you can just take a, a normal a file and then just kind of run it along the part on the lathe and it'll just take it off. Uh, you can denote this in saying, yeah, this is its dimension or it's just a light chamfer. And that's kind of telling the manufacturer of, yeah, it's not at any specific dimension. It's just making it kind of light so that it, you don't have a kind of a sharp area that'll cut your hand. Uh, we could have also put this as two separate 45 degree angles in the original sketch. But again, that just adds more and more dimensions and it kind of crowds out uh, all of the, well, all the entire sketch. It makes it a little bit harder to see what's going on. So if you want to, you can put it in your original sketch, but it may be slightly easier to show someone all the individual steps, what's going on, if you pull out those features into multiple steps. Now this is an assembly. This is one part of many pieces. So I want to actually screw them all together and I'm gonna be putting a thread on here. So let's go into create, click thread, and then click the inside face of here. And when we do that, it's gonna say, hey, you're in the inches units. This is a quarter inch diameter hole. So I bet you want to make a quarter 20 hole. Uh, for us, the quarter in this name basically just means the diameter of the bolt that would go into it. And the 20 is the pitch. That's the TPI, or the threads per inch. That is how many threads do you have per inch, essentially. Uh, very simple. Um, again, we can have this be modeled or unmodeled. If you do have it be modeled, you do have the actual literal thread in there. It does take up more data with this, so it may take a little bit longer to load. Um, if you have it unchecked, it just puts a little decal of a thread in there. So it's less data. So we really don't need to have a thread in there for any mechanical purposes. So we can just say, hey, this is a threaded hole. So for this final part, we do have two sets of drilled holes. We've got 16 holes drilled into this second ring and another smaller 16 holes drilled into this fourth ring right here. Now, because this is basically just patterned circularly all the way around the central axis, I can just make one sketch and one extrusion on this face, one sketch and another extrusion on that face, and then say, yep, 16 of those all the way around. So that's what we'll do. We'll make a new sketch, not on this top face, but on this next one down. And I'm just going to make a C4 circle. Click somewhere about there. Click again. I'm going to be adding a horizontal constraint. So the circle is directly above the origin. And then I can click D for dimension. And I know this diameter wants to be an eighth of an inch. That's a very common sized drilled hole. And then the distance from the center of the circle to the origin, that wants to be 0.62 inches. And then I can say finish sketch. 
then I can give it another one of those isometric views. And I want to make an extrusion cut so I can select this profile and say negative 0.5 inches. And that will then cut it uh, half an inch through our piece. And I want to do a similar thing again on this fourth plane. So let's go ahead and go create sketch. One, two, three, fourth plane in there. Again, make a circle uh, by typing C, expanding that, hitting escape. And I want to make a horizontal constraint between the origin and the very origin of the circle. And then again, clicking D for dimension, the distance between these two wants to be 0.275 inches. And this wants to be a 16th of an inch hole. So half a diameter of that. And then we can hit finish sketch. And again, we would like to extrude this negative 0.5 inches all the way. There we are. So now that we have these two holes or these two features, we can actually go and pattern all this way through. So let's go into create and then way at the bottom, we've got pattern and then circular pattern. And then as far as what do we want to pattern, we could either keep this as faces and select the inside surface of both of these, or we could change this to features and then select the two extrusions down there on the timeline. Either one of them works. And then for the axis, we want this to be the red uh, X axis right there. And then for our quantity, we want 16 of those. And we can do this because uh, they both share the exact same axis, even though the holes aren't on the same plane. That doesn't make a difference. And then hit OK. Fantastic. And then finally, I'm just going to add a polished aluminum uh, finish to it. Uh, where is aluminum? There we are. Let's make it look kind of shiny. There we go. So because this is a part of the engineering drawing uh, portion of this class, we are going to be again going into file and then new drawing from design. And we can save this as the emitter. That's fine by us. So let's click save. And then again, we do want the ASME. That's the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. We can have it as a sheet size B and we'll keep this in inches. So let's just click OK and then we'll pull up with our new drawing design. And for our base drawing, we can click anywhere we'd like, pop it down. This is a little small, so let's make it a little bit larger. So let's change this scale from one to one to two to one and then click OK. And as you can see, we've got all of these holes going through. That's a little bit hard to see what's going on. So we can always double click this if you want to edit something about it. And instead of having the hidden edges, we're just going to have only the visual edges. So this is what's called a wireframe design. So I'm going to pull this base view all the way over there. And just like we did with the drumstick class, I'm going to grab the projected view tool, or you can click P. And I'm going to select my parent view. This is what everything else is based off of. And I'm going to pull a front view over here. And then I also want to have a nice isometric view as well. Remember, anytime you're making a final project, uh, having all the dimensions and all the purely engineering angles, that's great, that's fantastic. But having that uh, final view, what's the final product supposed to look like? That always makes it just that little bit nicer to work with. And just having it be wireframe is also a little tricky to kind of fully uh, conceptualize. So we can always double click that and turn that into a shaded piece as well. That looks good. Uh, it's also kind of huge. So let's kind of put that down. It says two to one from parent. Uh, we're just going to change that to a one to one and then this can kind of live everywhere. So I'll put that right there. So in essence, this is a part that's got a lot of information about the outside, but more importantly, a ton of information on the inside. So I can dimension this really easily, but I can't really get access to all of the stuff on the inside, like all of these uh, steps that we made in our second feature. So what we're going to use is called the section view tool. This will basically bifurcate our part in any which way that we want, shove it off to the side, and it's kind of like a cross section. You can think of it just like a cross section analysis uh, where we're kind of splicing in the middle and then we'll have access to all the geometry on the inside. We can cut this at any point, but right down the middle is gonna be just ideal for us. Uh, we are basically saying, all right, what is the parent view? Well, I want to have this be my parent view because I want to slice it about that piece and then pull out one of those sections off to the side. Uh, I want my piece to be, or my cutting line to be right through the middle. So a good little trick is moving your cursor onto something in the middle, whether that be the top hole there or the very origin. As you can see, if I pull it just nice and slowly above, 
I have this little dashed green line that's saying, yep, it is perfectly horizontal. If you don't see that, you may just need to be a little bit more clever with your mouse. So click that once and then pull directly down and then just below uh, the, uh, the entire piece, click again. We don't want to make another line. So I'm just gonna click this little green check mark right there. And as you can see, now we have our cross section. So I'm gonna pull it over somewhere about in the middle of this. Uh, I still want to keep uh, the scale of it. I can still have it be visual edges. That's perfectly fine. So I can just click OK. And now we have a section analysis. Still says the scale. Um, but all this dashed line on the inside, you can edit this, but this is the standard way of how you say, hey, this is a cut from a solid piece. It's not like this dashed section is a shell or any internal information. It is purely a cut. Uh, it's kind of supposed to signify if you were to take a bandsaw and cut it through and because a bandsaw has all these individual blades it kind of leaves all these uh, striations to it. So another really good trick in CAD uh, that a lot of people kind of forget about is the fact that if I'm trying to move my views uh, it's always going to be attached with that parent so I can't move it up or down I can only move it left and right. Uh, I can mess around my parent view but I can't change around with any of the child views. Uh, I can override this if I uh, just click this piece and just imagine like I'm moving it left and right and then click shift then I'm able to move it around wherever I'd like but because my section view and my right hand view are connected I have another sub parent and child view. Um, I don't need any of this so I'm just going to go Control Z to get rid of that but remember anytime you need to move anything around click this click shift don't hold down shift just click it and then move it wherever you'd like another important thing that we may want to put onto this part is something called a datum identifier datum identifier is just saying which face is the most important face of this entire part that you're basing everything off uh, if i'm manufacturing this it means that this is made of a really large cylinder and the depths of all the holes, the depths of all these steps, it's all gonna be measured from one face and that's gonna be this outer face. So I'm gonna use this datum identifier and I can just click this outer edge of it. So yeah, somewhere about the middle and it'll put out a little flag there. And this is the only datum face that's so gonna be letter A. If I have a part that's got a bunch of really noteworthy faces that geometry is, is measuring in reference to, then you can put datum A, datum B, datum C. And this is the kind of information that you would put down in this text box uh, in the title block down here, where you say, uh, for example, this datum face, this is identifying the outer surface of our part. So we'll kick off our dimensioning by going to our original parent view and adding in all of our dimensions on this. We want to say what is the axial dimensions and then what are the radial dimensions here as well. So we can absolutely use the dimension tool for this or you can go into there and select all of the linear dimensions or angled or anything like that. But usually just the dimension tool is kind of the, kind of the multi-tool that you'll jump to all the time. Uh, if you find that any of the dimensions that you want to make are actually kind of interfering with the edge uh, of our bit of paper, if it's a little bit kind of blocked up and bunched up and things don't look kind of neat and tidy, remember you can always click and drag this. The whole purpose of drawing is to make a really neat, easy bit of information that you can give to a manufacturer and they can read it very cleanly. If you have a bunch of dimensions that are all crumpled together and it's kind of hard to see and only you can understand it, that's basically useless. So make everything neat and organized, make it clear and visible, okay? So again, let's go into dimension and then let's add some dimensions as we go along. So any of these lines that is necessary, any of the bits of geometry that are important to manufacturing this, that is what you want to denote. So as we go through, we'll add all the dimensions on here. For example, we can start off with the uh, radial dimensions, or in this case, the diameter. And we can select these all the way through and it's up to you to where you want to uh, where you want to place all of your dimensions if you find that uh, this is actually running or it's crash or the letters are crashing in between the lines of it then you may find it easier to actually pull this off to the side that looks a little bit neater to me 
but you can make this in any which way you'd like. Just remember, if you ever have any dimension lines that cross over each other, you can always use the dimensions and then dimension break tool, and that will uh, delete any crossovers you have. So go ahead and add all of your dimensions in there as needed. So as we finish up all the dimensions in this part, there's something really important about CAD that you want to keep in mind, and it has to deal with tolerances. So tolerances basically allow for the maximum or minimum size of what your part can be. If you say, no, it has to be exactly two inches, you can say, well, how accurate? If I'm in woodworking, uh, a pretty accurate measurement is down to a 64th of an inch of tolerance. If I'm working in metalworking, then a pretty standard tolerance is one thousandth of an inch or a thou. But the more tighter that tolerance that you want, the more expensive it is. If I say, oh, it just has to be accurate to about a hundredth of an inch, well, that's really inexpensive because you've got a pretty wide berth that you can kind of work between. If you say a thousandth of an inch, okay, well, then that means some of your parts may accidentally be made a little bit too small or too large, and then they have to be scrapped. Uh, so as you get tighter and tighter in tolerance, if you go down to a ten thousandth of an inch, which is pretty common in the world of aerospace or medical engineering, then that needs to be your tightest tolerance. Uh, just for reference, a ten thousandth of an inch is about a thirtieth of the width of a human hair. So you can get pretty, pretty tight with these. Uh, for this project, we're just going to say, hey, all the dimensions on here, unless stated otherwise, have a tolerance of plus or minus one thousandth of an inch. But there we run into an issue because if we have these five widths that get added up along the entire length of this part, well then it may be 0 0.005 inches too large or too small on the other end. But then that exceeds this total width, which means I have to say either this has a much larger tolerance or much smaller tolerance, or I have to add another dimension for this teeny, teeny, tiny little plateau right there. And for me as an engineer, it's going to be a lot easier to actually denote it down there. So we've got five pieces that may be a plus or minus of one thou. So let's add on uh, five thou plus or minus on there as well. So for this length, I'm going to double click it. And we've got this little dialog box right here. And I can check on tolerances. And I've got a different types of, of, uh, well, of tolerances that I can do. I can say, hey, what are my upper and lower limits as far as the exact dimension? I can say, well, how much is it deviating uh, if I've got only one thou negative or five thou positive because it's really important that it has to fit, something fits in it, but the outside doesn't really matter. Or would you like it to be symmetric? For us, symmetric is the most common and our tolerance is going to be 0.05 five thousandths of an inch and we can click click close but when we do this you can see that hey i actually it doesn't say that at all uh, and that's because i need to change my linear precision so i want to go from 0.12 all the way down to 0.123 and there we go now it's reading in there so i've just said that for this dimension but i could also go into my browser right here and i could say yep all my dimension units I would like to change that over to 0.123, so a thousandth of an inch of accuracy. And now you can see all of my numbers that exceed that, for example, this 0.272, that now reads the correct value. The ones that were exactly 0.2, that doesn't change whatsoever. So this is looking good already. So that little plus minus sign, this means it's got an upper and a lower bound of what we can work with. We are going to be doing a similar bit of CAD over here on the sectional view. Again, we're going to be using our dimension tool and we are going to be dimensioning what is the diameter of all these steps and what are the depths. But because when you're manufacturing, you actually want to start off by facing off or cutting off to get a new clean surface on this outer edge, which defined our datum point, instead of just saying, yeah, the distance between there and there, and then the distance between there and there, everything is going to be based off of this flat outer face because that's where you zero off and then everything is based off of that first groove. So we can say that yeah the depth between these two sections is 0.08. Yeah that's a little bit on the that's a little bit hard to read. Let's pull that out to the outside. But then for the next step 
it's a little bit further in. It's a little bit deeper than what we stated. And again, as you go further and further in, we want to pull these out to the outside and then we can organize it to make it a little neater as well. But go ahead and add in all of these dimensions, add in the length or the depth of the holes that needed to be drilled out and then add in the diameters of all these sections. So the dimensions for this piece look great. Uh, you'll notice I kind of switched around where the dimensions lie just so it's a little easier for all of our dimensions to look uh, a little bit neater as well. Um, you'll notice that I didn't dimension the threaded hole over here. We're gonna do something a little bit special for that uh, a little bit later. Uh, but for the meantime, we're gonna be working on this next front face right here. And we're gonna be starting off by creating a new sketch on this. Uh, just like we did for the drumstick, I need to denote the angle or exactly what is the arc in between this circle and the next circle. Exactly how much do I actually turn to drill out all of these sections. And to do that, we're gonna just gonna be using a line tool as a construction line to actually mark out the angle between all of them. Uh, you can pick any circles you'd like. Uh, I think this one to the very center and then to the center to the next one over and then hit escape and then setting these two as hidden. I think that'll work quite well. Remember the, the dashed line purely just means construction. We do not care if these lines are absolutely accurate because we're just using them as a reference. So we can now say finish sketch. And then by going into uh, our uh, dimension tool, we can now click both lines and that'll give us an angle. And unfortunately we got pretty close, but not exactly on the point. So if we have 360, de 360 degrees divided by 16, uh, that would give us an arc length of 22 and a half. Uh, not quite accurate, so we can just hit escape, double click this, and then we can always edit it. So 22, oh, let's get rid of that, 22.5. And then I do want to add in a little symbol. I'd like to add in the degree. And then there we go. That looks a little bit better. And then as you can see, if we move it, it does get kind of thrown out of whack a little bit. So kind of hold it in place. Uh, using the dimension tool, we can also say, what is the diameter of the holes? So I can say, yep, that one is wanting to be a eighth of an inch. And the inner section wants to be a 16th of an inch. Um, usually stating the, uh, the fraction sized drill bit as a decimal is always a little funky. So this may be the perfect place to double click it and say, no, it's actually not a 0 0.063 inch, it's a 16th inch drill bit. Um, that actually exceeds our thousandths of an inch uh, linear precision, but typing 0 0.0625, that is, is, is not really readable. So may as well uh, double click that and type in 16th of an inch if you'd like to. To place the dimensions of how far away are the circles from the origin, uh, it'll be a little bit easier to add in something called a center mark. Uh, this puts a little cross in the very middle of our piece, which denotes that this is the very center of our drilled hole. And this will also give us a really neat point to actually click to. So you can go ahead and try and get yeah, right there to the very middle and then click the outer, oh, excuse me, the inner circle ring. Uh, pull that down. Again, that should be a nice and neat number. Uh, if you're getting a value, something like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, or something that isn't that, uh, it's very easy to accidentally click the center of those two lines that we've made in the sketch. Uh, so then again, we can click that center mark, click the outer one, and again, this is also a nice and neat number. Now going back to the middle piece, we do want to put in the dimension of this hole, but we also want to state that it is threaded as well. And the nice thing about uh, Fusion is that it already remembers that we did put a thread in there and it also remembers all of the information about what type of thread, what class, everything about it is already in there. So we can go into our text tool and you can see there's something called a note. And this has a little lightning bolt icon under it, which means it already has a certain amount of logic, certain amount of information already built into it. So when I click it and then select one of these edges and pull it away, it'll already say, hey, this is a quarter 20 uh, unified threading, which is a 3B class. That's just denoting how tight of a fit do you have it. 3B is the most common. 
So by clicking OK, it already has the lingo that a machinist would be able to understand. I don't need to say, hey, drill out this hole and thread it to this diagnosis. It's already built in place for me, which is very nice of them. As far as notes go, I also want to say, hey, I do have some light chamfers on these ends. I don't necessarily need to say exactly what dimension they are because I'm just telling the machinist, hey, take a file, hold it at about 45 degree angles and just shave off just a little bit of that edge. I'm not worried about if it's to exact angle or an exact dimension. Uh, I just want it to not have a sharp edge. So this is a great example where I can say, hey, I just want to put in a leader note. Uh, it's just a little note that has an arrow going to it. So I could say, hey, that edge right there, pull down, just say, uh, yeah, a light chamfer is really all I need. And if you could spell it correctly, that would be uh, lovely as well. Um, you can also make another note or another leader note and say, yeah, I want to do it to that one as well. And then just click anywhere uh, about where the text lines up and then just don't type anything. And then this means that this note is applied to both of those edges as well. And then to wrap this up, we can always edit the title block right here by double clicking it to put in any extra information about our part. Uh, the really important things that we're going to note about is making a little text box uh, in this open area in the top left corner and then putting in any information that isn't necessarily about any specific location. For example, any notes that you would have like for light chamfering, yeah, that's about a specific location on it. But this title block, this is where you want to put information about the entire project. For example, my tolerances are one thousandth of an inch or unless stated otherwise. The only other place where I really care about that being where my uh, where I'd have a stacked set of dimensions would be my length right here. So I don't need to have plus or minus 0 0.001 inch on every single dimension because it's already stated in the title block. I can say that my material wants to be 6061 aluminum. That's 6061, that's just the alloy of aluminum. It's the most common type of material that you'll run into if you're in a machine shop and you're just looking for a perfectly standard bit of aluminum that's very easy to machine, very easy to work with. And then for our finish, we just wanna say, yeah, polish it up to a high sheen. All right, guys, that is gonna be it. Uh, make your parts and have some fun.